Welcome to Critical Care Fundamentals. These lectures are meant to be brief, and the goal is to give you, the busy provider, a basic framework of common critical care topics. My name is Frank Lodicerto. I am a MedPeds trained resident, and I have done two fellowships in both adult and pediatric critical care. I currently work in both the adult and pediatric critical care units at Geisinger Medical Center and the Janet Weiss Children's Hospital in Danville, Pennsylvania. I also serve as the Critical Care Fellowship Program Director. Today's topic is the basics of mechanical ventilation, part one. In this section, my objectives are for you to be able to list the goals of mechanical ventilation, number two, name the factors that control oxygenation and ventilation, and number three, lastly, I want you to be able to discuss the complications that may arise during mechanical ventilation. So, you made the decision to intubate your patient and start mechanical ventilation. As with any therapy or intervention, you will have specific goals, and mechanical ventilation is no different. The first goal is to ensure that your patient is comfortable, which may occur simply by helping them improve gas exchange and decrease their work of breathing. But mechanical ventilation and having an endotracheal tube in a patient's trachea can be uncomfortable, and every effort should be made to maximize patient comfort. This can be accomplished by making simple or sometimes complex ventilator changes and with the appropriate use of analgesia and sedation. The next goal is to ensure that you have adequately decreased your patient's work of breathing to avoid further respiratory fatigue. Again, recall that one of the main reasons you have begun mechanical ventilation is that your patient's work of breathing was excessive and they either begun to develop respiratory fatigue or were on the verge of respiratory failure. The optimal type of breath is the spontaneous breath. However, after you've placed the patient on mechanical ventilation, they may be too weak to accomplish a spontaneous breath, and the ventilator may need to fully support each breath for the patient until, um, until they regain respiratory strength. Now, you don't want to um, keep um, someone with full support for too long as they may develop respiratory atrophy. So it's important to find the right balance to ensure that you have decreased your patient's work of breathing and allow them to return to spontaneous breathing as soon as they are ready. The third goal is to ensure adequate, not perfect, but adequate gas exchange in terms of oxygenation and ventilation. This will vary depending on your patient's clinical scenario, but it will be important to clearly define your oxygen saturation goals and your CO2 range goals um, before you make your ventilator adjustments. For example, for most patients, you may allow a PaCO2 between, let's say, normal 40, but it can be even up to 60. But if you have a patient who's intubated because of a traumatic brain injury, um, you may not allow the patient's CO2 to be high. In fact, you'd probably want it in a normal range between 35 and 40, as an elevated CO2 can lead to increased cerebral blood flow and therefore increase intracranial pressure. Your goal is to allow adequate gas exchange and avoid harmful complications that can occur from trying to make gas exchange perfect when not necessary. Our final goal is to minimize toxicity or the adverse effects from mechanical ventilation. No matter how good someone is at mechanical ventilation, like most interventions, there's going to be side effects, but we want to minimize these as best we can. Complications can arise from overdistending the alveoli from high pressures, known as barotrauma, high volumes, known as volutrauma, and repeatedly opening and closing alveoli, known as atelectotrauma. We want to minimize our fraction of inspired, FiO, uh, fraction inspired um, oxygen, also known as FiO2, as higher levels of FiO2, likely greater than 60%, um, even for short period of times, can lead to oxygen toxicity and cellular injury. We lastly want to minimize cardiovascular side effects, which we will discuss towards the end of this lecture. Again, this is why we should target ranges for our oxygenation and ventilation as we are trying to minimize the detrimental effects. And the last and most important point is to remember that mechanical ventilation is only a supportive measure. What do I mean? Well, it's a supportive measure while you allow other interventions or more definitive interventions to work. So, for example, if your patient has pneumonia, well, maybe it's time for the antibiotics to work um, and so you can um, get your patient safely extubated. Um, if your patient has heart failure, well, perhaps they need 
uh, time uh, to you to mobilize that pulmonary edema to get them off the ventilator. So again, it's a supportive therapy and, and gives you time um, for more definitive therapies to work. So the next section we're going to talk about is a basic review of respiratory physiology. Recall, at functional residual capacity, or FRC, which is the volume of gas present in the lungs at the end, at end expiration and prior to inhalation, and a state of no gas movement in or out of the lungs. The natural tendency is for the lungs to want to collapse due to the elastic recoil and the tendency of the chest wall to want to expand outward. And at FRC, these forces cancel out and there is no net movement of air. Inspiration is an active process initiated by diaphragmatic contraction, which allows the diaphragm to move downward into the abdomen and the intercostal muscles to move the ribcage outward. The size of the thorax increases and thus increases the intrathoracic volume. As the intrathoracic volume increases, the pressure inside the thorax decreases and sets up a pressure gradient between atmospheric pressure. This pressure gradient allows a gas to flow from higher atmospheric pressure towards lower pressure and into the alveoli. Expiration is usually a passive process. However, in patients with obstructive physiology like asthma and COPD, this can be an active process and patients may have forced exhalation. However, normally in expiration, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles relax. The lung recoils and decreases intrathoracic volume and subsequently increases intrathoracic pressures. The pressure in the thorax then rises and becomes higher than that of atmospheric pressure and there is a net movement of gas from the alveoli to the atmosphere, completing the expiratory phase. Now, an important point to keep in mind when we are talking about mechanical ventilation is that it is a completely opposite process than what I've just described. What I just described is how we normally physiologically breathe, which is by a negative pressure circuit, where air is pulled into the lungs due to pressure gradients. During mechanical ventilation, there is a complete reversal of our normal physiologic breathing, and instead of air being pulled into the lungs by setting up a pressure gradient, in mechanical ventilation, air is forcefully pushed, not pulled, into the lung through a positive pressure system. Air flow occurs as a result of a machine pushing air into the lungs by a machine pressure rather than creating negative pressure system, allowing air to be pulled into the lungs. Let's first talk about oxygenation. Oxygenation works by simple diffusion. O2 will move down its concentration gradient from the alveoli and into the capillaries. The simplest way to improve oxygenation is to add more oxygen and increase the FiO2. The next way to improve oxygenation is by increasing PEEP or setting optimal PEEP. It's not just high PEEP, but it's optimal PEEP. We will discuss PEEP in more depth later in this talk, but optimal PEEP is essential. But the main factor controlling oxygenation isn't really PEEP, but it's mean airway pressure. Your mean airway pressure is the average pressure your lung is being exposed to during mechanical ventilation, both inspiration and expiration. Your, your, uh, since our lungs stay in expiration two times longer than inspiration, as a normal IDE ratio is about one to two, meaning that it takes two times longer to exhale as it does to inhale, we want to maintain an expanded alveoli so Oxygen can diffuse from the alveoli into the capillaries, thus we need an optimal PEEP. The last way to improve oxygenation, and usually reserved for patients with refractory hypoxemia, is to increase the inspiratory time. Our inspiratory pressure is much higher than our PEEP, or positive end expiratory pressure, and maintaining a higher pressure for a longer period of time will increase our mean airway pressure, and thus improve oxygenation. Well, how? Well, this improvement in oxygenation is by, well, number one, allowing redistribution of oxygen from highly compliant alveoli, which means more stretchy alveoli, to less compliant alveoli or more stiffer alveoli. The second way is by maintaining a larger surface area at end inspiration and allowing more time to diffuse across the alveoli and into the capillaries. 
So thus, one of the ways we can improve oxygenation is inspiratory time. Next, let's discuss ventilation or the removal of CO2 from the body. Ventilation also works by simple diffusion, but after gas goes through the body, CO2 builds up in our bloodstream and diffuses from the capillaries and into the alveoli. This is opposite of oxygenation. This may be different than what you've heard before, but I like to say that oxygenation works by diffusion and ventilation works by convection, or the process of bulk transfer of gases from one place to another. Ventilation is controlled by three main factors. Just like oxygenation, the first two factors could technically, technically be considered one factor, and that is minute ventilation. So minute ventilation is made up of two things. As you recall, minute ventilation is determined by a patient's respiratory rate and their tidal volume. As a patient breathes, they, inha they inhale gas essentially devoid of CO2. Now, to be physiologically honest, there is some CO2 as a result of CO2 remaining in the previously exhaled gas that mixes with the newly inhaled gas. And this is referred as dead space ventilation. And as a patient develops worsening respiratory distress and failure, there is more and more CO2 in the inhaled gas due to the increased dead space and therefore less of a gradient for CO2 to diffuse from the capillaries and into the alveoli. But as we inhale or transfer this volume of gas, devoid or low in CO2, into the alveoli, carbon dioxide transfers into and fills the alveoli. And then when we exhale, we remove this gas with large amounts of CO2 with it. So we can inhale a larger tidal volume and distend our alveoli, increasing then um, the transfer of CO2 into the alveoli, thus removing more with a larger tidal volume. Or we can breathe faster by increasing our respiratory rate. Now, as you'll see, and as we'll talk about, one of the limitations we have with mechanical ventilation is giving a patient too large a tidal volume. So for instance, what we try to do is limit our tidal volume between 4 to 8 mLs per kilo of predicted body weight. So yes, you can improve ventilation by giving someone a larger tidal volume, but you may cause more lung injury by causing volume trauma. So this is limited. So the main way we control ventilation on mechanical ventilator is by increasing the respiratory rate. Now, a very important point is this. When we have a patient with, let's say, obstructive lung disease like asthma or COPD, what I'm going to tell you seems a little counterintuitive. What we want to do here is lower our respiratory rate and allow more expiratory time. Now, if we do not allow um, a long enough expiratory time, this CO2 will be trapped in our, in our airways and we'll rebreathe it over and over, decreasing our gradient of CO2 from the bloodstream into the alveoli. So with a patient with obstructive lung disease like asthma or COP, what we want to do is lower the respiratory rate and give our patient a longer expiratory time or a longer time to, an, to exhale all the CO2 because they have bronchospastic disease. So keep these three things in mind. Respiratory rate, which is our main way to control mechanical ventilation. But in your patients with obstructive lung disease like asthma or COPD, optimizing your expiratory time is going to be essential to help remove CO2. As I mentioned earlier, no matter how good you consider yourself at using mechanical ventilation, there are going to be some side effects. These side effects or injury from the ventilator is known as ventilator-induced lung injury. We can do harm to a patient by using high pressures, which is known as barotrauma, high volumes, which is known as volutrauma, and by allowing often stiff diseased alveoli to open and then rapidly shut closed and open and again rapidly shut closed, this causes shearing stress in the lung or what we call atelectotrauma, which I'll talk about in the next slide. It is debatable which form of ventilator-induced lung injury is the worst, and the answer is they are all bad. And all three of these can lead to the next ventilator-induced lung injury, and that is known as biotrauma. Biotrauma is known is, is, is simply uh, lung injury from any one of the three I just mentioned, causing inflammation or the release of inflammatory mediators 
And these inflammatory mediators can, can injure um, nearby, often good uh, parts of our lung or other organ systems in our body. And the last toxicity we want to avoid, as I mentioned earlier, is oxygen toxicity. Initially, what I do when I set my um, oxygen saturations uh, goal is I'll say I want my patient to be, let's say, between um, um, 88 and above, or let's say 94 to 99. I never include 100% um, saturation in there because what I want is um, um, to wean the FiO2. Now, if my patient is satting 100%, and I'm on high FiO2, well, there's a problem. I'm going to want to wean this. My goal is never to have 100% sat unless I am on very minimal FiO2. My goal is to get the FiO2 down as soon as possible, ideally less than 60%, where you still maintain your range for your oxygen saturation. Again, if your FiO2 is too high, this can cause free radical injury and cause lung injury as well as other organ injury. A couple points here. Um, barotrauma. So what, what pressure are we looking for? Well, we're really looking at what we call the um, plateau pressure. Now, I'll talk about the peak inspiratory pressure on, on, in the next lecture. But the plateau pressure is the pressure uh, during positive pressure ventilation that the alveoli see, or the small airways. Um, this will not be displayed on your ventilator. So what you have to do is what we call an inspiratory pause. So you pause the ventilator at end inspiration. The ventilator will display a pressure. That pressure is going to be known as the plateau pressure. And that pressure is probably um, and one of the most important pressures to look at because that's the pressure the small airways or the alveoli are going to see. We want to minimize or limit this pressure to less than 30 centimeters of water. We talked about volume trauma. We want to keep our um, tidal volumes between 4 to 8 mLs per kilo per predicted body weight. Next, I'm going to talk about atelectic trauma. So this slide I created to give you a better understanding of why optimal PEEP is so important. First, fix your eyes on the bottom balloon, which is made to represent the alveoli at end inspiration. Notice it is well expanded and optimal to provide adequate gas exchange. Now, as the ventilator cycles in expiration, look at the balloon to your left. This alveoli has inadequate PEEP and collapses and develops atelectasis. Now to re-expand this alveoli to the volume that we see on the bottom of the screen, much more pressure will be needed to overcome the resistance of the alveoli from its collapsed atelectatic form and back to its volume at end inspiration. Inadequate PEEP or positive end expiratory pressure will result in sheer stress and the release of inflammatory meteors known as biotrauma. Now look to the balloon, or excuse me, the alveoli to your right. Notice much less pressure will be needed to re-expand this alveoli at end expiration because we have not allowed this alveoli to close and become atelectatic by providing adequate PEEP. We have avoided atelectatrauma trauma and hopefully biotrauma. The difference between the plateau pressure, which I've mentioned in the previous slide, or the, or the positive pressure that the alveoli see at the end inspiration, minus the PEEP is what is known as the driving pressure. The dri this driving pressure is thought to be a more important pressure than the actual plateau pressure itself, but we will discuss this at a later time. Next, we are going to discuss some of the hemodynamic consequences that may arise from mechanical ventilation. This picture is to, rem to remind us that blood flow or cardiac output is determined by a pressure gradient set by a high pressure system leaving the left ventricle and returning to the heart via a low pressure system to the right atria. Recall that we discussed when a patient is spontaneously breathing, they are doing so by a negative pressure. And this negative intrathoracic pressure causes a lower pressure system in the thorax, which allows less resistance to blood flow to return to the right atrium and assist in allowing adequate venous return and preload. However, when a patient is placed on positive pressure ventilation, this positive intrathoracic pressure will cause higher right atrial pressures and impede venous return. The effect of positive pressure ventilation, decreasing venous return and preload, is amplified when a patient is already intravascularly deplete a common factor we see in critically ill patients.
the, de the decrease in venous return and preload can lead to decrease in cardiac output and mean arterial blood pressure. And these patients may need a fluid bolus to restore intravascular volume and improve preload. This diagram shows that as positive pressure is delivered, causing a positive intrathoracic pressure, that this pressure is transmitted to the low pressure right atria. This causes the pressure in the right atrium to rise and impedes venous return and preload which I have just discussed. And as I mentioned, the side effect of positive pressure ventilation is typically more pronounced when a patient is intravascularly deplete and a major factor in patients who, and excuse me, and, a, and not a major factor in patients who are intravascularly replete. Another overlooked and, and important but not frequently discussed effect of positive pressure ventilation is its effect on the right ventricle. Due to increases in intrathoracic pressure from positive pressure ventilation, the right ventricular afterload increases. This is normally well tolerated, but in patients with right ventricular failure from long-standing pulmonary hypertension or acutely from RV infarction or massive PE, this increased RV afterload can lead to RV collapse and failure resulting in possible cardiac arrest. And lastly, and perhaps a beneficial hemodynamic um, effect of positive pressure ventilation on the left ventricle is that it decreases left ventricular afterload and allows the allows increased stroke volume and cardiac output. This, this occurs because the positive intrathoracic pressure decreases the pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the intrathoracic space. This can be beneficial for patients with heart failure and decreased inotropic function by assisting the left ventricle and allowing and allowing improved stroke volume and cardiac output. So thank you for listening to Critical Care Fundamentals. I hope you enjoyed this talk, and we'll see you next time.